Fuel cells, electricity, solar power, many energy sources have been touted. But what can we really expect to power our vehicles in future? Joining us now in Buffalo, New York, Lauren Fix. She's a journalist and automotive analyst. And Lauren, we welcome you back to the program. How are you doing tonight? I'm great. Thanks for having me back. Excellent. Let me read something that came out of the Associated Press uh, just a day or so ago. Uh, this is called Best Car on the Road. The Tesla Model S electric sedan is Consumer Reports' top pick in this year's automotive rankings. The magazine cited the Model S's sporty performance and technological innovations, including its 360-kilometer range. But it acknowledged that the car is expensive. Consumer Reports paid $89,650 for the Model S it tested. For less than a third of that price, the Toyota Prius Hybrid got the nod as Consumer Reports' top green car. People are, I've been reading, I'm sure you have too, people are extremely hopeful about what the Tesla represents in the car market. Are you? Um, well, I think it has an interesting spin. It's, it opens doors to other opportunities. I do want to qualify that Consumer Reports is one of many top locations to look for information on cars. They are, they are not by any means the sole resource or source in order to get information on cars. Although I do like the Toyota Prius because one, it does not have to be plugged into the wall. You still get the hybrid abilities of, of a vehicle. Plus you still have a little bit of gasoline as a backup engine so you never have that range anxiety. So from the average consumer, if they are looking to be on the greener side, I think it is the best choice. But when looking at the future of um, electric vehicles, I think that Tesla does open some doors saying that they don't have to be boring. They do have performance uh, and they're having longer range. However, you pay for that range and starting at $90,000, you can add all kinds of other options, including a service contract, which would definitely up the price. Well, of course, they're looking to somehow create a new battery manufacturing plant, which mm -hmm. would, they hope, uh, reduce the price of the car by 50%. Now, if these cars were available, say, five or 10 years from now at 40000 apiece, now you're talking, mm -hmm. aren't you? Well, the prices are certainly lower. The average price of a car, at least in the United States, is about $23,000. So they're still off the mark from it being a car for the masses. There is a problem with it saying that there is a car for the masses because if you live in the middle of the country, there's no place to plug in other than home. And electricity still costs people money. It's not free. And it's certainly not pennies, depending upon where you live. Now, if you live on, we call it the fringe of the area, which would be New York and up and down the East Coast and the West Coast, California, Seattle, that's where a lot of these electric vehicles are being sold more so than the middle of the country. And um, it depends on who the consumer is, what your situation is, if you want to haul a trailer. Obviously, an electric vehicle is not the best choice because they don't have towing capacity. So it depends on, I think there's always going to be a mixture of solutions. It may be something that will become uh, an option for consumers, but there are a lot of electric vehicles on the market. The BMW i3 is fantastic, and there's a dealer network. Any BMW dealer in the country can fix the vehicle if there's a problem. You need a warranty, not a problem. Need a replacement car or a part, not a problem. Tesla has some real issues with saying that they're the front runner when it comes to electric vehicles when there's so many other options out there from other manufacturers. Well, let's talk about one of them. And I got to do my full disclosure thing right now. I drive a Chevy Volt. You say power okay. isn't free, but I'll tell you what, it costs me a buck a day for the power to power that Chevy Volt. Uh, just for those who don't know, it's got a battery in it. You drive the battery mm -hmm. till it's exhausted, and then it's got an internal combustion engine in there as well. And you can drive right. another 350, 400 kilometers on, on gas just like any other car. What's your view on that technology as a potential you know, hybrid to the future, if you like? Well, I do like the Chevy Volt a little more. I, I, it is a great, a great looking car. It has great technology. You've got OnStar, which is wonderful. Uh, and the fact is you have dealer infrastructure. You have a problem with that Chevy Volt. You can go to any dealer that's a GM dealership in all of North America. They will you know, stand behind a technical service bulletin, a recall, a warranty problem. You can do all your service there, whatever needs to be done, whether that's purchasing tires or replacing wiper blades, because there's still going to be service. However, keep in mind that it's only a nine gallon gas tank on the Chevy Volt, uh, which means you'll have to stop at a gas station, but you're still getting Depending upon how you drive, where you drive, and your driving conditions, you can get anywhere from 30 miles to the gallon up to 100, depending upon if you just strictly run on electric. So I, I do like the hybrid as an option for those people that prefer a greener choice. However, I just don't like plugging it into the wall and having to pump gas. Uh, I would prefer it being a hybrid 
buy the gas, use the hybrid portion, and as technology evolves, you'll find that you get to use more of the hybrid side without having to plug it into the wall, as well as maybe an emergency backup gas engine. And that's what you're seeing in a lot of the other manufacturers, such as Audi and VW and Mercedes and Ford. They're all, they've got the Ford Energy. A lot of these manufacturers have come up, pretty much every manufacturer has an EV car if they wish to sell cars in the state of California. Uh, it's a requirement. Uh, even Fiat has it there. So I think that there is a future in electric vehicles because of the requirements by, by at least the United States government and each state. Um, but as far as plug-in, that may not be the sole answer because then it would be nicer if we could use regenerative brakes and other forms of electricity to charge the battery so you don't have to plug it in the wall and you still get a cool Chevy Volt, you still get <laughs> awesome service, and you get a great looking car, and I, it would be nicer if you didn't have to plug it in the wall. I'm sure you'd you know like what, that Lauren? even more. Lauren, I don't mind plugging in when I know I only have to buy gas once every two and a half months. Anyway, that's another yeah. story. Let me right. ask you about right. hydrogen powered cars. There was a time when yes. hydrogen powered cars looked like it was going to be the next thing, and now it doesn't. Mm -hmm. What's happened there? Well, that was back in the Bush administration here in the U.S. Ford and GM both had hydrogen-powered fuel cell cars. I drove both the Chevy Equinox as well as the Ford Explorer. It was hydrogen. It was awesome. It, it was quiet. It had just moisture coming out. The tailpipe was water. Uh, it, it was environmentally friendly. Uh, initially, they were saying that the stations where we would fill up, and we actually went to one of them, we had a, a person who was actually filling up the car as quickly as, as it was for gasoline. Uh, so it didn't provide a job or two, but at some point they say you'll be able to connect it up, sit in your car, hydrogen is in, just as if you pump gas, disconnect it, and you're on your way. So that is, I think, a, an excellent option, and I think there will be multiple solutions for getting off of some of these fossil fuels. So you don't think that the major car companies have given up on hydrogen as the future of cars? No, they had to put them on the shelf for a long time because the Obama administration was really pushing the electric vehicle. He really wanted to have as many, a million electric vehicles on by the end of his first term. Uh, those of us that are analysts in the industry knew that wasn't a possibility when only 3.3% of the current North American auto sales is electric vehicles. So that's not that much when you're thinking about 15 Point four to 15.7 million vehicles expected to be sold in 2014. 3% is such a small amount. But, you know, there are a lot more other options, plus gasoline-powered cars are becoming even more fuel efficient for those that prefer it, and there's more diesel vehicles available as well. Let me ask you about the potential of biofuels, you know, the ethanol or the biodiesel options. Uh, where do you see those going? Well, ethanol is a whole other story. Uh, here in North America, we use corn. So uh, there's been a lot, a lot going on with that, where they take corn, it takes seven gallons of water to produce one gallon of ethanol. That ethanol is then given to the oil, ma the oil manufacturers who take crude oil. They break it down five times for diesel, seven times for heptane. Heptane is gasoline, which is what you pump in a regular combustion engine. But when they're adding 10% ethanol, and the government was trying to push the 15% ethanol, um, it was causing consumers to have 30% less energy per gallon of gas. So they were actually costing the consumer more at the pump. It was costing them more at the grocery store because farmers were saying, you know what, why, why grow oats when I can grow corn and get government subsidies? So, you know, it makes common sense for them from a business perspective. So from that point, you will also note that there are tons of ethanol plants that have never had a person in them, never run, and just sitting there stagnant in the Midwest. In addition to that, the destruction that it causes to the internal combustion engine, the fuel system, the emission system makes ethanol not the best choice. Uh, as far as biofuels, there's some great biofuels. I've seen them using switchgrass, which is a great solution. Again, to build a lot of that, we have to look at the process that it takes, what type of energy is being used to produce that, to break that down. Um, it used to be you could go to the donut store or the local coffee shop and say, hey, you know, when you're done with that oil for frying the donuts, I'll take that off your hand for free, hmm. and you'd add a gallon of kerosene to it, and you could run it in a diesel-powered vehicle. It would cost you nothing. It was <laughs> you just filter out the donut pieces, you know, or the French fry pieces. So there are some great solutions that are being developed. Uh, I've seen solutions with algae as well. So I think the future is going to bring some great options, as well as natural gas. Compressed natural gas is also another solution. So there's more and more solutions coming up every day, and there's going to be a multitude of answers. There is not just one answer. Well, that's what my next question was going to be, which is, given all the options we've talked about so far, have you resolved in your own head what you think the preponderance of the market will go for over the next decade or two? 
Well, that's difficult. Uh, based on some analysis that I recently read, it said that by 2020, half the vehicles on the road, now we're talking about not just cars, we're talking about tractor trailers, things that are actually driving on the road, will be diesel. So by 2020, they're saying half the products on the road will be clean diesel. Now, we're not talking about the old diesel with black soot coming out the back. That's back from the 80s. We're talking about since 2000, there is clean diesel. And what they're doing is they're putting urea, which is manufactured, man-made manufactured urea, into the exhaust pipe, which reduces the emissions. It reduces everything that was poisonous that could cause damage to the atmosphere to actually bringing those exhaust emissions down below that of a combustion engine. So that's why you're seeing diesel being something that's used highly in Europe and in a lot of, the, a lot of other countries. And every manufacturer makes a diesel powered vehicle, but they're not bringing them into this country until the US standards match the German standards or the, or the EU or everything that's over there. When they do match, you'll start seeing more and more vehicles coming in. Hence, you're seeing Chevy bringing in the Opel engine and putting it into the cruise with the 2-liter TD. You've got Mazda bringing in the Sky Active, And, of course, every single German manufacturer, except for Mini, unfortunately, is bringing in diesel. You see Porsche's got the Cayenne diesel. You've got Audi. Every single product in the Audi lineup comes in a diesel option. BMW, same thing. They offer what's called Blue Tech. Same thing with Mercedes. VW, so every single one has a, has a diesel option. If you haven't driven diesel in a long time, I'd just say take one for a test drive. You don't have to buy it. You might fall in love with it. I've fallen in love with my clean diesel, and I get 760 miles on a tank, and I only fill up once a month. Huh. Okay, well then in our last 30 seconds here, Lauren, uh, do you see a day coming soon when people mm -hmm. go to shop for whatever they're going to get, a car, pickup truck, whatever, mm -hmm. and environmental impact is as important a consideration in the purchase of that vehicle as all the other things like cost and safety and uh, right. you know miles per gallon or kilometers per, ga per liter, all of that stuff. I, I would like it to be as an important of a factor to consumers, but I think in Canada, they're much more aware of being green in other areas of the world. The United States, we have such a mixture of people all over the world that there are people that will be extremely uh, green technology and how to save the environment while others it's going to be a lot longer for them to uh, swallow that pill. And I, I think once they do and they realize that it's all for cause of everybody's, everybody succeeding and you know, using less fossil fuels and saving money and the environment, I think it's going to be a long time. That's Lauren Fix, the automotive journalist from Buffalo. Lauren, good to have you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.